Hello and welcome to the Agrarian Conversations webinar series. We'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Please do introduce yourself in the chat for now. Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. We are ready to start. So let me introduce you to the co-host of this amazing um, seminar, webinar, a uh, root hall from class, please say hi. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth and I'm chairing the session today with, uh, with Tanya Ralia Martinez. Um, over to you, Tanya. Okay. So um, it's so amazing to have many people from different regions of the world uh, joining this brand new webinar series, Agrarian Conversations. And today's webinar, it's called, What Can We Learn from the World of Pastoralism for Agrarian Wider Agrarian Struggles? This webinar will be in English with interpretations in French and Arabic. Please see the instructions on the screen and in the chat for accessing the translation. And don't hesitate to ask in the chat if you have any questions. If you want to listen in English, just stay where you are now. Uh, if you want to listen to the translation in French, please press French. If in Arabic, please do Korean. And please, Hamza, can we have you for some seconds to explain that? Yes, of course. <laughs> للمتابعة الندوة باللغة العربية المرجو الضغط على زر الترجمة على شكل كوكب في أسفل الشاشة واختيار القناة الكورية وكرر اختيار القناة الكورية لمتابعة الندوة باللغة العربية um, For suivre le webinar en français veuillez appuyer sur le signe interprétation qui se trouve en bas de votre écran et choisissez la langue française Merci Thank you um, if in Burmese, please press Russian and help us please do ra to explain this. Thank you. Back to you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Now let's go to Ruth so she can introduce this series of conversations. Thanks, Tanya. So today is the first in a series of, uh, of, we of webinars called Agrarian Conversations. Uh, it's an initiative largely of Global South scholar activist research networks that decided to come together and launch a new webinar series uh, that focuses on critical agrarian studies and scholar activism. So we recognize that nearly a year into COVID lockdowns, webinars are a busy space. Uh, they're not that original. Uh, why do we want to have a new series of webinars? We want this to be distinctive. These webinars will not be frequent. They will likely be only four or so per year. It's not focused on current affairs, nor are we trying to influence policy, nor are we reporting research findings. The idea is conversations between and among scholars and activists. The focus is on urgent issues in the rural world today. We are choosing big blockbuster kind of topics, things that have global relevance and resonance. Uh, and we are going to be in each case providing prior reading so that people will read and then engage on that basis. We will be putting the link in the chat 
for the reading for today if you haven't already seen it. Explicitly, we want to foster conversations across generations, foregrounding the voices and experiences of women and people in the global south. We want to have cross-fertilization between more established scholars and younger scholars, between activists uh, and researchers. And we want to not only revisit old debates, but address new edgy issues and look at new dynamics in the rural world that need to be understood and confronted uh, as struggles continue. We also want to get big names, big rock star people and push them to talk in accessible ways about their work and broker a dialogue with younger people, activists and researchers. And think about who are the next people in the next generation taking up these issues. We're gonna have uh, a conversational format. Uh, this is not about a long lecture, a short input of no more than 15 minutes, followed by a discussants in a panel and then open discussion. That means a maximum of one and a half hours. It's up to all of us to make it interactive within the constraints of this format. Um, we want to foreground particularly perspectives from the global south, yet uh, we have to deal with language the main language for the series will be English, and in each case, we will decide which languages are most important for interpretation, uh, depending on the topic. So this is an initiative anchored in the traditions of some of the organizations in this network, uh, peasant studies and others who are committed not only to scholarship, uh, but to uh, the conversations that bring to life uh, the big and urgent issues facing the rural world today. I'm going to hand over to Tanya to introduce you to the organizations co-hosting this, and then we're going to get into the first input. So, first, uh, we have the collective of agrarian scholar activists from the Global South, and me, in this case, representing them. And I would like to give the floor to Ian Scons and Pastress. Come and say hi, please. Hi, um, great to be here. Really looking forward to the conversation. And yes, I'm representing Pastres. Hopefully we can pop the, uh, the, the, the link to our website up on the, in the chat. Pastres stands for Pastoralism, Uncertainty, Resilience. And I'm gonna be talking lots about that. And I see lots of the team which uh, are already here. So looking forward to the discussions. Thank you, Ian. Uh, now let's give the floor to Annie Shattuck from the GPS. Good morning, everyone. I'm Annie Shattuck. Welcome on behalf of the Journal of Peasant Studies. Okay, Natasha Bruna from ERPI. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome on behalf of the Emancipatory Rural Politics Initiative and its regional platforms. ERPI is a collective of activists and scholars uh, working with political processes and reactions in rural areas. For more information, follow us on social media. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Sergio Coronado from ICAS. Hello everyone, Sergio Coronado from the Initiative in Critical Agrarian Studies, a community of scholar activists working on agrarian issues. We started working about a decade ago and one of the greatest achievements of our network is the publication of uh, the, the ICAS book series. The first one was Class Dynamics of Agrarian Change by Henry Bernstein. And the last one is Agrarian Change and Generation by Ben White. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, Yara Ditsa Torbike. Tsifa, sorry, Tsifa, do we have you there? Okay, uh, let's move to Rashes 5, Segaye Moreda. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Segaye Moreda representing Rashes 5, which stands for commodities, uh, land rushes and regimes reshaping five spheres of social life. It's a European Research Council advanced grant project based at the International Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands. Nice to meet you all. Thank you, Segaye. Cathy Shanwell from TNI. Hi, hello. My name is Katie Sandwell. Uh, on behalf of TNI, I wanted to welcome everyone. TNI, the Transnational Institute, based in the Netherlands. And I just wanted to take one moment as well today to remember Miguel Tuibal and Theodore Shanin, 
two committed agrarian scholar activists and former fellows of TNI who passed away in the last year. We're very glad to see their work carried forward in this initiative, and I wish you all a wonderful discussion today. Thank you, Kari. Um, well, Sifa, I don't know if we have Sifa yet with us, if not. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm here. So okay. the network of uh, young African researchers in agriculture was born at the Land Policy Conference in Addis Ababa in 2014. It's a network that seeks to center the voices of young African researchers in global and continental debates on agriculture and food systems. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Ruth Ho from PLAS. So uh, wearing a different hat, uh, welcome on behalf of the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies, PLAS, which is uh, a research institute at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. And we're very pleased to be part of this initiative. Moving forward to today's topic, um, as the series of uh, webinars indicates in our title, our purpose here is to deepen agrarian conversations. Today's topic is what can we learn from pastoralism for wider agrarian struggles? And of course, agrarian studies has often focused on peasants rather than pastoralists, or pastoralists have been relegated somewhat to the sidelines even within agrarian debates. Uh, as we set out in the, in the invitation to this event, uh, pastoralists are some of the most marginalized people on the planet, but they have much to teach us all. Uh, and like agrarian societies everywhere, pastoralists are confronted by multiple crises and pressures in this moment of global neoliberal capitalism, uh, as many people face uh, their livelihoods being undermined. But what can we learn from pastoralists? Um, we are very excited that this first edition of uh, the Agrarian Conversation series will explore what opportunities there are to learn from pastoralists and also to raise the question about how to seek greater engagement across agrarian movements uh, between uh, farmers and pastoralists. So we're bringing this issue which has been marginalized even within agrarian studies to the center so we can all learn from it. If you're on Twitter or other social media, please do comment as you go along and share the conversation. We're using the Twitter hashtag agrarian conversations and hashtag pastoralists. So please do share your thoughts and reflections with us as well. Uh, in terms of today's format, we're going to have one short input from Ian, followed by perhaps provocative or challenging new ideas from two discussants. So Tanya will introduce you to our three speakers for today. Okay, just one a reminder before we move into that a, to our speakers we need to remember that there's a translation happening so we need to slow down so the people or, or translators can help us with this huge a uh, task so let me introduce you to our three greatest speakers of today first of all we have ian scones who is a professor at the institute of development studies university of sussex he leads the pastors pastoralism uncertainty and resilience program supported by the european research council over the last 30 years, he has worked on land, agrarian change, and pastoralism, mostly in Eastern and Southern Africa. He is also a member of the editorial collective of the Journal of Peasant Studies and author of the background paper of this webinar. We also have Rahma Hassan. She is a PhD fellow Hello, from the University of Copenhagen and University of Nairobi under the Rights and Resilience Projects in Kenya. She has worked in social development research in government and globally on research on health, gender and governance. Currently, she is researching community land rights among pastoralism, pastoralist communities in Kenya. Sorry, Rama, to, can you come and just say hi? Yes, hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We also have Mariam Rahma, Ramanian who is an independent expert on issues related to biodiversity and agroecology with 20 years of experience working with smallholder producers, organizations, researchers, and the United Nations at national and international level. She is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, IPES Food. She also has been a research associate at the Center for Sustainable Development and Environment, vice chair of the high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition, member of the steering committee of the Economics 
of Ecosystems and Biodiversity for Agriculture and Fat, Food Study and Research Fellow at Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany. So as you can see, we have many amazing speakers today. Miriam, please come and say hi. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Hi. Thank you. So the dynamics is going to be that Ian is going to speak first with Rama and Mariam responding. Then we will open up the conversation to include your questions and comments, starting with a few questions that some people already shared through email. Um, so in your questions can be, or you can type them through the Q and I a bottom that you can see on your screen. If you are also joining us from social media, you can type in your questions and we will try to gather them. Through all the session, we will be sharing links and resources for further reading in the chat box. So keep an eye on that box because it's going to be a good source of information today. Um, we also know that there's like a lot of knowledge from all of you that are attending this a webinar. So we would love to hear from you. Now, with no more further to add, I'm going to give the floor to Ian. Ian, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya, and thank you, everybody, and thank you for this invitation. So exciting to have so many people attending a, uh, a presentation on pastoralists and peasants. So let me get straight into it and start with my basic argument. For historical, disciplinary, and political reasons, studies of an engagement with pastoralists, frequently mobile livestock keepers and peasants, settled small-scale farmers, have been separated. Today, I argue, this really doesn't make sense, even if it ever did. Across the world, pastoralists and peasants are marginalized politically. They've been subject to the depredations of neoliberal capital through processes of enclosure, privatization, commoditization, and so on, and must increasingly make their living in new ways in highly uncertain conditions. In confronting uncertainty and having network mobility at the center of their practices, I'll argue, illustrating this through a number of different themes, that pastoralists have a lot to share with settled small-scale farmers and indeed the wider world. In turn, joining forces across agrarian struggles and injecting these with, with these particular ideas from pastoral experiences, I argue, could really help invigorate agrarian movements. So who are pastoralists and what is pastoralism? Pastoralists make use of variability. They live with and from uncertainty. They harvest nutrients across extensive and diverse rangelands. There are many types of pastoralists, of course, from those who are fully nomadic, to those who move regularly, to those who combine livestock keeping with farming, to those who look increasingly like ranchers hooked more firmly into capitalist circuits. Pastoralists, I argue, are important for debates about food, biodiversity, climate change, land use, because rangelands where they live occupy between 25 and 40 percent of the world's surface. There are many millions of pastoralists, these are some pictures from just our own study sites, who keep cattle, they keep camels, yaks, sheep, goats and more. They live in some of the harshest environments on the planet whether the savannah rangelands of East Africa, the deserts of North, North Africa and the Middle East, the mountain pastures and steppes of Asia, or the hills and mountains of Europe and South America. So why have so-called peasant studies and studies of pastoralism diverged so much? And what are the key features of each? Very briefly, peasant studies emerged from the concerns around the incorporation of peasants into capitalism the global forces that precipitate this and the consequences for patterns of accumulation, for social differentiation, for labor relations, for class formation, and yes, of course, for politics. Dominated by Marxist scholarship of different forms and a concern with particular types of articulation with capitalism, the field of peasant studies developed in a particular way. By contrast, Studies of pastoralism were dominated by anthropologists, human ecologists, and others. Initially with 
essentially functionalist approaches to explain adaptation to difficult environments, such studies focused on social organization, kinship, cultural practices, and patterns of assumed egalitarianism. Now, of course, there have been overlaps and interchanges between the two, but they, for the longest time, inquiries were pursued separately in different places with different frameworks. This, of course, in turn, fed into how social movements engaged in agrarian struggles, identified challenges and coalesced around particular issues. So perhaps the largest social movement in the world, La Via Campesina, for example, focuses almost exclusively on peasants, smallholders, even though with some nods towards fishers, farm labor, livestock keepers, and so on. In the same way, many debates about food justice, land grabs, and so on, are so often framed by the concerns of settled smallholder farmers, not pastoralists. That said, AFSA, the Alliance for Food Security in Africa, has a very good set of case studies on pastoralism central to its work. And the argument here is to bring this debate more centrally in. But equally, pastoralist movements have tended to again to be a bit separate, focusing often rather narrowly on particular constructions of indigeneity, cultural values, heritage, and so on. So to my mind, this separation doesn't make sense as the challenges faced by both pastoralists and peasants are increasingly similar. So both peasants and pastoralists are politically marginalized, often ignored by the state and the wider projects of so-called development. The extension of capitalism, land and green grabs, different forms of extractivism, the commoditization of nature and so on, affects both pastoralists and peasants harshly. Pastoral societies are increasingly differentiated too with strong class, gender and age differences, just as in agrarian settings. And the hiring of labor and migration for work is a central part of both forms of livelihood. I could go on and on. These new shared contexts and challenges, I argue, need new responses. And this is where lessons from pastoralists come in. Again, some pictures from our own study sites. As I've said already, Pastoralists gain a living by living with and from, crucially from uncertainty. Variability is a resource that is central to pastoral livelihoods. Uncertainty can be an opportunity, a source of hope, not just a challenge and a constraint. Certainly from our studies under the pastoralist program from Amdo Tibet in China, to Gujarat in India, to Isiolo and Burana in East Africa, to Southern Tunisia, and Sardinia in Italy, we are seeing again and again how the basic principles of pastoral systems persist despite massive changes to these areas. So some examples. It means that pastoralists are very good at adapting to change through flexible practices, notably mobility, along with the reconfiguration of social arrangements, labor, land, and other resources. So we see this in Kutch in India, for, for example, as Rabari pastoralists move through farmlands, industrial zones and urban areas negotiating access to grazing. Such movement allows for the flexible use of increasingly fragmented mosaic landscapes in really innovative ways. So for example, in Amdo Tibet, investments in infrastructure, national parks and so on have disrupted former herding practices, but pastoralists draw on a variety of different institutions, the village, the monastery, local government to maintain flexibility. This in turn all relies on forms of social organization that can respond quickly. So intersecting kin, clan and wider networks are absolutely crucial. Among the Baran of Southern Ethiopia, for example, the management of grazing and water resources, just as the deep wells in the past, continue to be managed across diverse social networks. And all this can be helped by technology, mobile phones and the internet, for example, to assist movements in response to disasters or to sell products to diverse consumers, but always rooted in social relations. 
So, for example, when locusts struck Isiolo in Kenya last year, people identified swarms and mobilized motorbikes to scare them away from valuable grazing through phone connections. Meanwhile, in Sardinia, in Italy, pastoralists who once sold their sheep to centralized dairies had to innovate during the pandemic to sell local, locally made cheese products through new connections. Now, yes, of course, these are all features of peasant farming settings too, and necessarily increasingly so. But I want to make the case that these are especially well-honed practices amongst pastoralists who have lived with and from uncertainty for millennia. So here's the question for everyone. Can these themes help us rethink agrarian struggles more widely and learn lessons from pastoralists? In the rather long background paper that, I, that was shared uh, for this webinar, and apologies for the length of it, it was based on a very wide review of studies of pastoralism across the world. And I tried in that paper to distill out a series of themes, seven in all, that might help us reframe a more joint approach to thinking about agrarian st struggles with pastoralism firmly part of this. Now I've talked about some of these already, but I just want to reiterate a few. And these are first and centrally living with and from uncertainty, the overarching capabilities to respond flexibly and to generate reliability in the face of uncertainty and ignorance. And given the challenges generated by climate change, by pandemic disease, by market volatility, by conflict, by contested politics, I argue this is crucial. Second, mobility and movement to respond to variability, including new forms of mobility and migration, not only moving livestock across the rangelands, for example, but transporting water, fodder, as well as the mobility of labor. Third, the importance of flexible land control and new forms of tenure arrangement not just fixed forms of private or communal land use, but much more diverse tenure arrangements we see to make use of fragmented mosaic forms of landscape. Fourth, dynamic and flexible social arrangements. We see this as absolutely essential in pastoral settings, allowing for the reallocation of resources, livestock, labor, and other assets to enable this adaptability uh, to changing circumstance. Fifth, the importance of collective social solidarities. In a way, a new forms of moral economy that emerge that allow uh, redistributive allocations and survival for uncertain times. Six, engaging with complex real markets, including linking formal and informal approaches to market engagement in flexible ways. And last but not least, a network politics for a transforming world. And by this, I mean engaging across people and issues, linking classic agrarian struggles with those around labor, environment, food, climate justice, for example, as well as indigenous rights, heritage, and so on. So in sum, to conclude, I suggest that these seven themes can help add new perspectives to critical agrarian studies and by involving insights from pastoralists more broadly, develop new framings, new approaches for agrarian struggles more broadly. By thinking about living with and from uncertainty more generally, I'd also argue that there are wider alliances still that can be forged. Just thinks about the responses to the coronavirus pandemic, for example. All seven of those themes that I mentioned are highly relevant, North and South, as the pastorist team discussed in a recent uh, article in the Journal of Peasant Studies. And through linking out in this way more widely, there are, I think, real opportunities to find common cause amongst all those left behind and made precarious by our increasingly turbulent world. Certainly peasants and pastoralists, 
but I'd argue others too. So I want to conclude there and I really look forward to the comments and discussions and uh, uh, hope to hear from our many participants uh, about this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. That was an excellent and perfect timing. <laughs> uh, we will now go straight to our next discussion. Uh, as we mentioned, Rama and Mariam are going to respond briefly building on their own experiences. So now let's uh, give the floor to Rama. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya and Ian, for introducing us to this paper, which I find very innovative in many ways, and it attempts to bring together pastoralists and peasant uh, debates um, to the fore. A very great uh, way of drawing from both studies and the debates that have been running parallel. We are aware, for those of us working in pastoralist uh, studies in East Africa and in this region, about these academic histories that have not paid to pastoralist um, studies and pastoralist issues. And this paper elicits more discussions and observations. For instance, in the just concluded uh, Journal of Peasant Studies Workshop, we thought about the application of these theoretical frameworks and concepts from agrarian studies in analyzing pastoralist issues. And certainly the three problematics that you put in your paper are a good reference point for us and others working in this area, the production, accumulation and politics broadly. Uh, for others who are not in academics, this is also important because it helps us to see the current rural challenges and societal problems that are being experienced by pastoralists in different parts of the world, in the global south, for instance, and the peasants as well, and the issues that are preoccupying them and uh, for students studying uh, these two groups. So because we are asking ourselves what we can learn from the world of pastoralists, it's great to have uh, these seven themes as presented by Ian and to help us to rethink uh, this agrarian studies from pastoralist perspectives. But then, because we are uh, in, in our daily lives interacting with pastoralists, we observe a lot of blockages to the well being of pastoralists in East Africa, for instance. And the same is uh, among the small farm holders. So, how can we, uh, scholars from uh, the regions working with pastoralists and peasants and activists in this group, and community workers, government officers working with these communities. How can we um, help these communities organize to counter these excesses of accumulation and dispossession and exploitative uh, um, systems? Because these themes are useful and they help us to reflect on the strengths that pastoralists can bring to, and we can suggest that agrarian communities adopt. But then we also, um, have some debates around this flexible land control, the dynamic social formations, and the much talked about uh, diversification, which is linked to mobility, which is um, from both uh, sides. Perhaps uh, my contribution to Ian's paper would be just to uh, you know, reflect on this great paper and ask then we need to pay attention to the threats that face pastoralists. For instance, Currently, the Rights and Resilient Project, the University of Nairobi and University of Copenhagen is looking at the land question and the climate change adaptation strategies among these communities. With the very many changes happening as described in the paper, there are so many more unresolved land questions and they affect these two groups similarly. Although we observe a similar problems among the agriculturalists in East Africa, for instance, there are differences in the laws and policies and how they are relating to the settled communities and the pastoralists. An example of the new law, land law, the communal land law and the institutions that keep uh, pushing pastoralists further away from these seven themes that Ian is talking about. For instance, the law would obligate the pastoralists to reorganize on how they access land and pasture and more towards uh, you know, individual property rights and less and less about um, on communal grazing. In the flexible access and the land tenure in the paper, we are seeing more and more power struggles and the elites, the modern pastoralists pushing back and, and, and the incursions of capitalism as Ian talks about in his paper. And in different forms and how group ranches are organized, for instance, in Kenya, we are seeing new avenues of exclusion and uh, 
women, for instance, their identities such as age groups, and there are more and more um, people being left out and excluded. So who is being included and excluded even as pastoralists um, through these seven themes uh, cope and survive over the years? The interesting thing is that even with all these challenges that uh, pastoralists face, they still go back to the safety nets that they have, the social networks that they have, and as well as the complex nature of their sharing, which will be interesting for agrarian communities to borrow from these uh, groups. Because even when there are excesses, even when the laws are not in tandem with their lifestyle, their memories, their histories, their culture, the way they are organized and how they rely on each other still assist them to survive and uh, cope uh, with the, the, these uh, challenges that they face. And if there is a common bond, then it is the effects of climate change for these two groups. And there's a lot of attention globally on climate change, food systems, and these two groups are affected, yes, differently because pastoralists are interacting directly in the arid and semi-arid lands. Some Ian talks about devolution and you know how different groups are getting into blocks to organize. And this has uh, aided some of these communities in uh, this, for instance, in Kenya, they call it, the, they used to call it the wild north. And uh, because, you know, left out, stigmatized populations, they are ungovernable. We have seen this in literature, but now we are more and more seeing pastoralists diversifying, getting into agriculture. So we see so many connections as is suggested in this paper. And for that reason, um, this is uh, quite interesting to borrow from uh, both, but also interesting to see pastoralism as the first uh, webinar for JPS and the other teams to, to be the first uh, to be discussed and also shows we are bringing the discussions from the margins to the center so that we also recognize other groups and the strengths that we can borrow from this long uh, written about peasant studies and as well as uh, uh, pastoralist groups borrowing from um, peasant studies. For us in uh, academia, of course, and young uh, scholars from the South, groups like I belong to, like uh, CASAS represented here and Yara, this is interesting for us because uh, we have been debating and sometimes getting um, wondering whether pastoralism fits in this agrarian studies. So Ian's paper also gives us a good platform to look at this uh, uh, debates, theories, concepts, and borrow from both. So thank you, Tani. Thank you, Rama. That's an excellent reflection. Um, so let's, yeah, you, you ask some key, key important questions. But now let's continue elaborating on the discussion and go to the next discussant. Could we please um, have your inputs, Mariam? Yes, thank you, um, Tanya. I would, first of all, I want to congratulate Ian um, on this paper, which I found really thought provoking and um, overdue, I think, and also JPS for publishing the paper. Um, I really do hope that this paper will, and I'm sure it will lead to a lot of reflections among this massive group of um, people that seem to be on this webinar and, 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 and I'm sure it will sort of live on in further reflections of people. So I really welcome uh, the ideas in the paper. I want to speak from my own experience, um, which is for a period of about 10 years, I worked in an NGO in Iran and we were working with nomadic pastoralists. So this is about 2002 to 2012. And my experiences uh, relate mostly to the seventh theme that, um, that Ian um, identified. So this networked politics. Um, I was working in Iran with pastoralists, but I was also representing the region of West Asia in uh, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, which is a platform uh, still uh, working hard um, of different constituencies, different producer organizations and all the regions and NGOs. Um, in terms of this networked politics and in terms of specifically um, relations between peasants on the one hand and pastoralists, I'm going to pass quickly over the international, the, sorry, the national level, um, because although uh, there have, for, for millennia, there have been um, important um, interactions between pastoralists and peasants in Iran, sometimes cooperative, sometimes conflicting, 
Um, but in my experience, in the years that I worked with Senesta, um, the number one problem of pastoralists that they identified was access to land. And their main problem was not the peasants. The main problem was the government law and policy, which basically uh, disappropriated them from their lands. Um, so so it, I, I think that I, I worked less on those peasant pastoralist interactions at the national level. But at the international level, in, in the IPC, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, I found myself there representing West Asia, a region where pastoralists are important. And there was no one in the IPC. Um, there was Via Campesina, there were the fisher folks, there were indigenous peoples, there was no one from peasant, uh, a pastoralist organization. And, and certainly at that time, there was no global level pastoralist organization anyway. So, um, but it was extremely frustrating uh, to be in this space of alliance building for a common movement for food sovereignty and the pastoralists are absent. So I felt that I um, had to try and bring up the issue. Um, and it was um, the responses that I, that I, um, that received me were many people sort of saying, what are you even talking about, you know, who are pastoralists? I mean, that, I think that is a real issue that people, some people just don't have an awareness. Um, they, they haven't had the experience, they haven't had the interaction. Some people sort of saying, oh, yes, 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 we've worked with pastoralists, this is a fantastic issue, and livestock diversity is so important, and blah, 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 um, and the rangelands, and blah, blah, blah. But nothing really much happened. Um, but after some years, after some years of going on and on and sounding like a broken record, um, stuff did start to happen. So I'd like to speak about two specific experiences, which for me were very important. One is in 2006, some of you may have heard um, of this mm, very nice event that was organized by the IPC in Porto Alegre called Land, Territory and Dignity. It was a conference uh, parallel to an FAO conference on agrarian reform. And our group of, of this NGO, we went to this conference in Brazil with a pastoralist from Iran. Um, and we looked at the program um, and there were different working groups and we sort of decided which working group we had to be in. And they said, you have to stay in the same working group for the three days. And it was clear to us that the, the working group that spoke most to us was the one called territory. So we were super excited about that because you, you would think, you know, that the, the FAO conference was agrarian reform. It was the social movement conference that had the word territory in it. So we went to the territory working group. Um, it was a sort of medium sized uh, room. We walked in, there, was, there were a few of us from Iran and we were confronted by um, a few, like really literally three or four indigenous peoples. I think they were all from Mexico or from Latin America. And that was it. That was the territory working group. Um, but we had a blast. We really found that with the indigenous peoples, the discussion on territory was rich. Um, it was stimulating. It was productive. Um, and you can go and see the declaration and see the two paragraphs that our working group produced um, all about uh, territory. Um, so just some of the highlights in, in those two paragraphs, we say that we that this effort, this movement should not just focus on our agrarian reform. We say that there is a concept of territory, we define it, we talk about the cultural aspect, the, the cosmovision aspect. We agreed strongly on um, the importance of tradition, of customary tenure, um, you know, it was almost as if we were speaking the same language. Um, the, the one difference I would say is that with the indigenous peoples from Latin America, for them, there was a strong demand for self-determination and autonomy, which I think comes from a context of indigenous people under colonialism, which was not our case and, it, and we didn't have this concept. Um, but certainly most of it was 90% was of it was totally agreed. Um, and that was extremely stimulating. And, and, and I think that many of you will, will have seen that this concept of territory in the food sovereignty movement, in the voluntary guidelines on tenure, it, it starts to become more and more important. And I think more and more people, perhaps not enough, are understanding that we're not just talking about agrarian reform and that we're talking about territories. So that was, I think, one really interesting experience. The second one, 
is during that same year, again, 2006, I was representing IPC in, um, in the steering committee to organize the Nielany Forum on Food Sovereignty. I think many of you have heard about it. It's referenced in Ian's paper. Um, it was an important conference that took place in Mali in 2007 that really tried to um, take a big step forward in terms of alliance building and movements and so on and so forth. I'm, I'm going to close in about two minutes. I hope I'm not over time. Um, just to say that um, when I was in the steering committee, I was really at that point getting frustrated by people sort of not um, picking up on this thing of the importance of pastoralists. And I it was clear to me that some people, as I said, didn't really have a concept of who pastoralists are. Other people, so for example, a, a peasant from Central America, no, would sort of say, okay, I have no problem, but what are you talking about? On the other hand, a peasant from West Africa knew very well who pastoralists were um, and really didn't want to talk about it because here we're talking about real conflicts on their territories. Um, and I was super frustrated at this and I really uh, pled, made a plea um, for, for making a space in the Nialini um, conference to talk about our conflicts between us because here we are trying to build a movement and yet there are these hidden conflicts um, and how are we going to move forward um, if, if we don't acknowledge them? And so I said, you know, we have to have, you know, we have to, and then I saw everyone in the steering committee sort of looking at me and sort of asking, are you seriously proposing that in this big conference, we make a space to discuss conflicts between peasants and pastoralists? I mean, that's a Pandora's box, are you serious? And thankfully at that moment, um, uh, a peasant woman from France who happened to be there uh, said, you know, I think it's a bit too negative to talk about conflicts. I think we need to talk about sharing territories. And that was just like an aha moment. Um, and, and one of the working groups in that conference, you can find all the documentation online is called sharing territories. And so this, this space was created in that conference and you can see the outcome. Um, and it was really interesting because the people, again, it was not one of the bigger working groups, but it was extremely diverse, maybe 30 people, peasants, pastoralists, fisher folk. I mean, they'd been attracted by this name, sharing territories. And they came together and they basically said, we, we do have conflicts between us. We've always had conflicts between us. We've had ways of negotiating and arbitrating these conflicts and those ways are no longer working and on top of that there's more and more competition for those same resources so we're in a completely different context and we want we need to find a way to get out of this context and for them and you can see in the final report um, strengthening their own organizations was the number one thing whether peasant pastoralists fisher folk or whoever indigenous peoples because it's these organizations in their vision who should be negotiating rules, because of course we need rules. If we're sharing territories, we need rules. And it's, we need these strong organizations which can negotiate and create rules and arbitrate on these rules. And we need to strengthen, they said, our traditional management systems and their vision for the role of the state was, was that the role of the state is that they protect our rights. No, but it's us who makes these rules and it's us who sort of, you know, between us, between these different food producing constituencies, we make the rules and we figure out what to do. So those are two really interesting experiences from my perspective. It's, it's perhaps a shame that none of this is documented and it's only in the heads of a few people. Um, but I just put them on the table as a provocation and a discussion for for that networked politics um, theme that Ian. And just to say that I think of those seven themes, I think besides that one, I think the ones of mobility, of the point about living with uncertainty, these really resonate with me. And I think there's a, I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a huge potential to learn from pastoralists because I think we're heading in the direction of a world where we need to, to be, become better at these things. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Ruth, over, over to you. <laughs> Thanks uh, to all three speakers for really moving us very rapidly into what's clearly a large and complex terrain. Um, so thank you also for many people who've been contributing in the chat. 
in the Q&A. Uh, there's several themes that seem to be emerging, and we will get through several uh, in the next little while. Uh, so please do not only ask questions, but also we're very interested to know your responses uh, to the arguments that have been set out. What resonates uh, in the context in which you are living and working uh, and which are the areas uh, in which you take issue with or disagree with Ian, Rahma or Mariam. So we are, uh, we are going to do as best as we can to get through these questions. And to start off with, uh, perhaps we can pick up on several questions that address the question of the state. Um, and uh, several people have, have dealt with that. Um, and uh, I'm just going to try and find it. Yes, uh, Fahmid Zaid said uh, in the Q&A, what's pastoralism's relationship with the state and borders? The state and borders can be considered a useful theme in this review. And I think perhaps this relates to points uh, that some of you have given, uh, made in your inputs. Rahma talked about uh, states viewing pastoralists as unruly or ungovernable. Uh, Ian, in your paper, I think you talked about uh, the ways in which states have presented pastoralists as being barbarians outside of the gates, outside of territories of state control. And Mariam points out that actually um, pastoralists' main concerns was not peasants in the Iran um, Sinesta case, but rather uh, access to land and state laws. Uh, so um, perhaps what we can ask is for our panelists to engage with this question of ways in which pastoralist struggles uh, are on the one hand for territory, uh, which often brings them into confrontation with the state, not only in relation to, to peasants, and the potential therefore for, uh, for joint alliances. Who would like to, um, or perhaps we can ask in the first instance, since Mariam touched on this quite a lot, if we could get some short responses on the question of how pastoralist movements and uh, peasant movements uh, uh, might connect in their engagements with states over territorial control. Any thoughts, uh, firstly, from Ian, briefly, on thinking about the state and the state in relation to pastoralist uh, strategy? And then, Rahma, if you'd like to add. Thanks, Ruth, and thanks for the question. Uh, it's a really important one because the relationship between pastoralists and the state, obviously, is one of often of tension. And the question asked about borders. Borders often were imposed on pastoral territories in an arbitrary way during colonialism and indeed before, meaning that ethnic groups, trade routes, etc., were divided by arbitrary divisions of the state. And as the states tried to assert power in the margins of their territory, uh, the narrative about pastoralists being unruly barbarians, if you like, outside the settled state, um, held sway. And this is why the tension very often between pastoral societies and central states exists and why development projects and modernization projects and capitalist projects of intervention in these areas have been so fraught and why there is a struggle very often between state authority and pastoralists. There's a fantastic paper in JPS by uh, Tor Benjaminson and Bubakar Ba on, on Mali. Why do pastoralists join up with jihadist movements in, in parts of, of the Sahel? Well, the answer is, from their analysis, not because uh, you know, they have any, necessarily have any particular affiliation with, with these, these struggles, but because the, the jihadist movements are opposing this type of this form of state authority which is has been undermining their livelihoods for so many years and pastoralists you know we we have in one of our uh, publications the, the you know, taking from jim scott's argument about s seeing like a state well what does seeing like a pastoralist mean from the margin seeing like a pastoralist is very different and not surprisingly pastoralists see the state as a source of rent extraction, a source of 
uh, land grabbing, a source of uh, a set of grievances which often go back generations. So it's not surprisingly that in most settings, the tensions between the state and pastoralism is, is, a, is a core aspect of politics. But the argument that Mariam, of course, made is that many of those grievances are the same as what peasants face on the margins. And that's why I think the network politics and the alliance making is actually more tangible these days and more potentially more productive as both groups suffer the same form of depredations, either from the extension of capital and investment or the, the effects of the state. Thanks again. So pushing on with this question of the state and, and uh, Rahma, maybe you'd like to add on to that. Also, there are two uh, comments or questions that have come in in the chat uh, about the Sahel uh, and East Africa in particular, and the role of um, pastoralism being one of the triggers or seen as a trigger of conflict, uh, or perhaps the context for that conflict. Um, so uh, one of our um, participants uh, has, has Sidi Yahya Tunkara has made this point that uh, jihadism has taken the difficulties uh, uh, to its advantage, opposing the Peul community to many other farming communities uh, in both Mali and Burkina Faso, um, and asks what direction pastoralism should take in, uh, in the Sahel. Uh, a related question from somebody who's anonymous says that increasingly in East Africa, there's a push towards or proposals for further developing the fodder in, uh, production industry uh, to help reduce mobility and increase the resilience of agro-pastoralists. But this would mean enormous changes in lifestyles. So without asking you to say what should be done, perhaps you'd like to, to comment on the ways in which these conflicts are emerging and often states are there in response pushing towards trying to get pastoralist communities to adopt more sedentary types of livelihood practices. Thanks, Ruth. I think uh, the earlier one on state and borders has been um, addressed by Ian. Just to reflect on our region here, the pastoralists have defied these borders. We have the Tanzania-Kenya border. Pastoralists, Maasai's move uh, uh, during droughts and the networks are across the board. The same in the north with Ethiopia, with two communities speaking the same language separated by these uh, borders and in Somalia. So we have three examples and as well as Uganda across uh, the Pokote, Karamoja regions. But the question on um, conflict and um, what is reported in this uh, all the time about the warring communities. Uh, sometimes we hear reports that this is about pasture, this is about uh, uh, clans. But this is more, it's, it could be a scholarship question, but it can also be a policy question. And looking at uh, governments and how they address uh, these issues, these threats on uh, exploitation and climate change are equally pressing for pastoralists as they are for the peasant producers. And if government has, has over the years, we have seen in literature how pastoralist communities have been marginalized. And this certainly lies in policies that improve the basic services for these pastoralists. Because if it's about access to markets or livestock, an example here about how we can have fodder and reduce mobility, that's actually one form of mobility, as Ian says in his paper, that mobility, not in the traditional sense, but also how can we move pasture? How can we move, you know, even um, ideas to different uh, places and communities? So if government doesn't support pastoralist production and the focus in many of these communities where we are, are on agri agricultural communities, it would benefit to have policies that are you know, towards um, ensuring these uh, pastoralist communities also benefit in having access to these services and water that sometimes causes this conflict. But the inevit inevitability of conflict, of course, has been debated elsewhere. It is not true that this conflict is happening and likely to happen is like a ticking bomb, but communities are just trying to survive and cope uh, uh, within the means that they have. Okay, so thank you very much, Rama. Um, we have like a lot of questions, which is so exciting, but now let me place one that it, it's about gender and social differentiation. So we have two questions. 
Um, it's not directed to anyone, but I think I'm going to pass it to Mariam. So the first one says like, um, should nomads and pastoralists are always grouped as one or can they be separated? That's one. And it also links to uh, what about gender in pastoralist studies? What's, what, what are the role of women, how the social uh, relationships are influenced also by all this social differentiation among pastoralists? Please, Mar Mariam. And then I would like to hear also from Rama and Ian. Thanks. Um, in terms of nomads and pastoralists, um, uh, I I think that nomads are, but I, I think I'm not the best person to answer this question. I think someone else can, it, it's a definitional question. Um, regarding women and gender issues, well, I'm not going to comment on pastoralist studies because I'm not really a scholar of pastoralism, but I can reflect on experiences in Iran. Um, I think that the, um, it's certainly the role of women is changing as the whole society changes and the production system changes. Uh, I'll give you an, an interesting example. Um, pastoralists in the northwest of Iran, as in some other parts of the country, and are getting more and more access to irrigated land for farming, privatized with deeds. So they're trading large areas of rangeland territory, grazing territory, for a smaller piece. When you get this smaller piece and it's your private property, then the question of how do you share it among the brothers, brothers and sisters comes up. When it's a shared territory, it's sort of like the tribe together. The ownership is a clan, a family group. It's not even ownership. I mean, it's access use. Um, these types of things, I think, I, I think the role of, of women and, and gender issues are changing drastically. Um, I'm afraid I'm beyond just these examples. I'm not sure that I'm the best person to try and <laughs> get a, um, a conclusion from that, but I certainly think that um, it's interesting. Thank you. Okay, um, Ian, but then I'm, I'm also adding another question. What about the role of future generations? If we're thinking that, that relations are changing, but also like with pastoralist communities are not homogeneous. Absolutely. I mean, just to echo what Mariam was saying, I mean, what we're seeing in, in virtually every pastoral setting across the world is this process of increased differentiation and increased differentiation by class, by gender, by age. And this means that different people have to now specialize in different ways in the pastoral system. And this has both negative and positive implications. Very, I mean, sometimes new resources, particularly privatized resources or increasingly commoditized forms of pastoralism tend to be taken over by men to the exclusion of women. But there are other opportunities. For example, in East Africa that Rama will know well, women have taken on a massively important role in the marketing of camel milk, for example, huge, really important commercial chains across the region. So we see quite a, a variety of different gender and age relations emerging. But I think the important thing to, 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 to comment on is that the process of uh, incorporation within the state, the process of the extension of a particular type of commoditized capitalism that's affecting pastoral, pastoral areas as it has done um, peasant areas, is this shift to, more, to, to a more individualized form of, of production and a more individualized form of territoriality? Because in the past, and this still exists, these collective forms of solidarity and social relations were so important as part of pastoral systems. And they still are. They still are. But that is the tension that I see as an important one. But actually, the forms of collective arrangement are, are still so essential for dealing with uncertainties. Um, so because things aren't owned individually, they're often owned collectively. You know, you don't necessarily only own your animals or only own your land. It's owned in, in the family, in the clan, in the wider, the wider group. That allows that flexibility that is so, so essential. And then the individualized uh, 
gender differences or even age differences are to some extent evened out. But that pressure is, is very real. I mean, I don't deny it. And that's the one that, that everyone is struggling with. The extension of forms of state control and forms of, 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 of capitalism that affects production systems is moving towards a more individualized, commoditized thing, uh, system that, that very often, but not always, as in the case of milk, camel milk marketers, undermines particularly younger people and particularly uh, women in, in these production systems. But I don't think that's different to peasants. And again, that's the, the, the parallel. I mean, I think that the lessons from pastoralists about collective forms of, of, of engagement around property are as important in, in, in peasant systems. Thanks, Ian. Uh, just reflecting further on this uncertainty and uh, crisis kind of um, framing, uh, one of the observations from Enrique Castanon is, it seems to me that highlighting pastoralists' capacity to live with and from uncertainty might be susceptible to being co-opted co by liberal arguments keen to frame politics as an issue of just taking the right choices. How can we avoid this? Can we incorporate uh, the serious and increasingly structural constraints that pastoralists face without neglecting the agency? Uh, if you'd like to reflect on that as we go forward, I want to uh, ask if, uh, as well as reflecting on that, on the, the dangers in the sense of um, foregrounding resilience um, while also addressing structural constraints. If I could ask any of you to uh, share with us, uh, several people are sort of calling for, uh, are there particular, beyond the, the global network level, are there particular local contexts in which um, effective alliances have been built between uh, pastoralist and peasant communities um, uh, in response to shared structural crises. Um, in other words, uh, this kind of moment of, of uncertainty that can actually forge divisions between pastoralists and, and peasants, are there cases where that's been, uh, uh, when populist attempts to, to foster conflict across those two communities has rather given way to, to alliance building at a very local level? Can we learn from some of the positive examples uh, in local alliance building? So those two questions, how do we hold back against the uh, sort of uh, co-optation of the resilience narrative um, to address uh, the agency and structural constraints? And what are the positive examples of alliance building at a local level? Yep, thanks Ruth. I think uh, the point on uh, the gendered pastoralist network has been made and uh, of course we relate a lot with this patriarchal networks in East Africa that have been written about in the past and uh, who owns what and uh, who gets to benefit from this resources at land or who is who has the um, permission, for instance, to sell a cow or a smaller animal like a goat, and this has been written about. But then there's more to look into the gendered networks of pastoralists. So the seven themes that uh, Ian presents in his paper can further be looked into to the sides that uh, the role of women and, the, and gender in this, uh, in this uh, too. And of course, culture and religion. I think uh, comments from the participants are referring to this Islamist group, jihadists, and in East Africa, we have a bigger problem um, uh, uh, on, on that as well. So is it because pastoralists uh, relate to these struggles or are they part of the struggle? And do they find this as a form of expressing their struggle when they are pushed to the corner or are they just um, in their uncertainty trying to adapt and uh, cope with what's happening around them? In local networks for East Africa, I think someone else in the chat or group who works with the small farmers can give examples, but uh, the recent arrangements in Kenya where we have um, uh, devolution and so pastoral communities and agricultural communities are sort of have to work together to, to have this going. Of course, we don't have strong movements unless someone from East Africa in the group can share, but then there are opportunities based on how resources are going to the, to the ground and how these groups continuously have to be together, forced to be together or have been relying together, but now resources are bundled together for them. So these are opportunities for them to, to exploit. Can I come in, Ruth? Oh, Mariam, you go first. Okay, just quickly on um, 
Sorry, just quickly on um, the alliances at the national level or some kind of conflict resolution at national level. Uh, to prepare for this um, discussion, I asked a colleague who works now on a much more regular basis than I do with pastoralists throughout the country. Um, and I asked her for a positive example and she had to think long and hard, um, but she was able to find one. Um, and so there are a lot of, there are small scale, sometimes larger scale conflicts over access to territory. Sometimes it's the farmer taking his sheep into the rangelands of the nomads. Sometimes it's the nomads going uh, in, the, in the other direction. And she said there, she did know of one case um, where they basically, and what happens normally is these, these conflicts, if, if you know, they tend to end up in some kind of court system if they're really serious. And in that sort of state um, justice system, it, there's a huge bias towards um, farmers, of course. No? There's a strong um, blindness, if you like, to, to the importance of pastoralism for all these reasons. In this case, um, these two sides were able to negotiate a shared access. And my understanding is that that had to do with the leadership that both sides showed. And that a specific leaders who said, look, let's not get into the court system. We can figure it out. Um, so that's, that's one example, but it wasn't easy to find it, I'm afraid. Thanks. Ian, you wanted to add? Yeah, just quickly. Um, I mean, of course, there are many, many conflicts between pastoralists and agriculturalists, but also between pastoralists and between agriculturalists. We have to ask, well, what is the origin of these conflicts? Um, because there's this standard narrative that pastoralists and agriculturalists are always at loggerheads. But this is, you know, simply not true. I mean, we've seen, as Mariam just mentioned, and, and Rahma, that there have been long-term negotiations between agriculturalists and pastoralists. I mean, the sharing of dung, the use of, of fodder, and so on and so forth. This, the mutualism between these groups has been, been very long-term and continues to be almost more so these days as the constraints on territory become uh, you know, more, the obligation to negotiate uh, increases. And very often this is highly successful. Where do these conflicts come from? Not from necessarily, you know, just because farmers hate pastoralists and vice versa, it's become, it tends to emerge from wider grievances against the state or impositions and land grabs of particular areas uh, uh, through larger investments. That's a different dynamic. That's a different causal relationship of this conflict. Um, and I think we have to be quite careful there. There's a great paper that uh, was produced by Severio Cratley and um, Camilla Toulmin at IIED recently on farmer herder conflicts in West, Central and Eastern Africa. I'll, I'll find the link and put it on the chat. And basically they looked at all the data on conflict and most of the data was not due to farmer herder conflicts, which was the narrative. It was actually due to wider structural issues of the consequences of investment, the consequence of state imposition. And this is where the structural question comes in. So it's not just agency. Agency is important in this day-to-day this -day negotiation, but that agency is often constrained and conflict erupts because of these wider cut structural constraints. Uncertainties very often are the, exactly the result of these wider con structural constraints. So we've got to keep these in tension and, and, and uh, talk about them together. But just to say that all conflicts result emerge from, from animosities between farmers and herders is simply not correct. These conflicts emerge through wider structural changes and relationships with state and investment in marginal areas. And these are increasing. But that's different to saying that always farmers and herders are at, are at loggerheads because actually over millennia, they've necessarily had to get on. Super, thanks Ian. Now, just thinking about as we're going to be moving towards wrapping up, a, a huge range of themes emerge from uh, the comments and the questions. Uh, one around these concepts of uncertainty we've been dealing with, one around that these are actually much wider generic issues about managing the commons, um, and that much can be learnt from engaging more deeply with uh, issues around uh, the commons. Some of the participants who have commented on that particularly have said um, 
uh, we need to look at understanding systems of managing the commons, uh, whether agro-pastoralists, that sedentary farmers who also own mobile livestock can provide lessons on, on the politics of shared territories. Uh, many people are asking, um, uh, what's the relation between pastoralist communities and the agrarian reforms that some farmers are pushing for? Uh, but presumably, um, some of these uh, issues arise precisely uh, in the context, Ian, that you were talking about, where land grabs threaten potentially both farmers and pastoralists, and in that response, there might be uh, more collaborative responses. Just before we head towards uh, wrapping up, there were um, a couple of questions that specifically asked about uh, questions around um, indigenous knowledge, uh, decolonial theory, um, and, and forms of, uh, of identity politics. Uh, and of course, this often cuts across potentials for alliance building. So as we move towards wrapping up and thinking about the potentials, uh, is there, are there examples where forms of indigenous knowledge have or can be shared across these populations? And does this concept of territory open up new space uh, for engaging with uh, decolonial theory? Um, uh, who would like to uh, respond on that? Perhaps um, any takers, Rahma. Yes, it's interesting um, conversation here on um, African commons. People have written on this as well, um, Okodo Gendo and uh, Kameri Mbote at the University of Nairobi. And uh, the argument has been that uh, maybe this formal laws and rules that have been brought down to pastoralists do not sync with their way of life. And so customary practices have been watered down in the process. And one of the things we can borrow, Ruth, uh, from this indigenous communities is the way they resolve conflict in the customary practices, deep uh, traditional ways. Of course, others have um, argued that uh, they have um, affected women negatively. And so, you know, there's a, an argument against those, but um, largely in terms of um, coexistence and sharing resources and solving problems across uh, communities, this is one of the things I think we can look at um, in terms of um, how we can borrow from the knowledge that exists among these communities. Uh, thanks, uh, Rahma. Tanya, I think it's it's over to you. Okay, well, I'm very sorry that we have to finish this discussion. We have many questions and comments, so it was so nice to have all this great interaction. Uh, but for today, I think I'm just going to ask our speakers to have a final word before we move to the final issues for this webinar. Uh, let's go to you first, a uh, Mariam. Like a final comment you want to make? Um, a final comment. Um, I find this discussion very exciting. Um, uh, I think there's lots and lots and lots to um, to think about. Um, my own uh, what 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 this discussion preparing it especially for it made me think is um, you know after 2012 when I left that space what happened to that space that for me that workshop of sharing territories was was an amazing um, discussion and that was in 2007 the concept of territory opens a space um, for different people to come together and maybe get out of this concept of private property and, and, and more about the commons as other people have said. Um, and what happened to that discussion? I ask myself that question. Um, I don't know what happened to that discussion. No one really took it, as far as I know, took it forward, at least at that level. But I think that at the local level, as the small example I shared from Iran, that there are there are cases of different groups coming together and saying, let's not go to the courts, let's solve this ourselves. And I think it would be wonderful to find those, to find them and to, to understand what's happening and how to promote them. Thank you. Well, I hope this platform helps to bring more people that is working on that issue. So you can like create this network. Um, Rama, please. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, interesting conversation, and um, I can see the interest from around uh, the globe. 
and so many comments from our region, of course, with other people who are directly working with pastoralists, living, and who are pastoralists themselves. So this is a good opportunity. There are other platforms, like I mentioned in the beginning, and so many interests coming from different uh, groups, researchers working on pastoralists. And globally, we have seen a lot of attention on ecosystem restoration, like the UN decade on ecosystem re restoration. Previously, we would hear pastoralists are exhausting and degrading the ecosystem, but now we are seeing that actually they are agents of change. And so they are adapting to these harsh environments and peasants can also borrow and maybe move into the arid and semi-arid areas and you know make them adaptable and move away from the reduced uh, uh, farmlands in the arable areas. So there are many things we could um, share on this and it's great to see so many people engaging and looking forward to sharing our findings and reading from others who are working on similar areas and um, engage further with this conver agrarian conversations. So just like a uh, linking to what uh, Rama said and Maria, uh, you have the information of our speakers, the Twitter, if you want to drop them a message, you have the links of the website uh, so you can be in touch. Ian, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone. I mean, I've been watching the chat come up on my screen, and I wish I could engage with every single comment on it, because there's been some great discussion there. Um, but just to conclude, I think, for me, this debate is very much about how there's a particular set of blinkers that we exist through, which hide the mobile, the flexible, the adaptable and the ability to deal with, with uncertainty. And I think that's what, to me, engaging with pastoralists shows. And I think it shows it for everybody, wherever we live. I mean, as I mentioned in my talk, the pandemic has, has illustrated that those seven themes that I talked about are relevant to everybody, north, south, east, west, peasant, not peasant. So I think there's a real conversation to be had here that goes beyond the sort of particular policy details, but to the, the wider conceptual framing of how we understand the world, actually. It's quite, it's almost more profound than, than the individual, uh, because I believe that we are in a period of turbulence, a period of uncertainty, which is facing us all. And those who are able to, to live with and from uncertainty, as pastoralists can do, under major constraints, many of which we've discussed, uh, can teach us all a thing or two. Yet the blinkers of development, of colonialism, of our particular framing, settled sedentary framing uh, that we're taught in universities and, and come through development projects and so on, undermines that. And I think there is a moment for agrarian movements to join together and think other new ways of thinking new ways of acting, new ways of challenging that framing in ways that uh, we haven't thought about before. But pastoralists, indigenous peoples, many peasants and others have already. So that would be my plea at the end of this. But uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you for the organizers for making it happen. Thanks a lot, Ian. Um, thank you to all of our guests, Ian, Mariam and Rahma. I'm aware that uh, all of you have engaged very seriously over many years with pastoralist organizations. Uh, and perhaps one thing that we need to think about for the future is how to have on the panel and not just among the participants, uh, pastoralists and uh, representatives of those movements uh, speaking. That said, uh, Ian through pastures, uh, Mariam through IPES, Rachma through universities of Copenhagen and uh, Nairobi are involved with a lot of networks where this conversation will continue. Uh, and of course, here and in future webinars, hopefully, we will uh, turn our attention to what does this mean for activism? What does this thinking uh, and set of, of arguments and insight mean for the role of research as well? So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to ask uh, TNI to put up a poll right now so that we can consult all of you who are still here about what uh, future webinars should focus on. Um, the nine organizations and networks that have put together this first um, this uh, first webinar have not defined what a future program will look like. We want, as I said earlier, to have topics that are feel urgent, uh, where there's something very big and new to be said that has global relevance, 
so it could be focusing on an area, but uh, thinking about something that speaks broadly um, and something where there are shifts that are of importance for activists, for rural activists and for research. And so I invite you in our last minute or two to look at the list of particular ideas that we've started to think about. Uh, the first being really, you know, this provocative idea, uh, do we see really a new food regime being prefigured in China's going out strategy and argument that's been put out there? We could be engaging with uh, key people in China around that. Um, uh, COVID and perhaps the politics of migrant labor, including transnational migrant labor, which is so crucial in agrarian contexts, Author authoritarianism, populism, and the rural world uh, right now. Uh, that has been um, a key issue taken up by the ERPI over some time, but is unfolding in new ways. Urban dimensions of critical agrarian studies like urban agriculture, rural urban linkages, and hybrid livelihoods. Uh, fifthly, mining, energy, and, and increasingly non-agrarian rural landscapes and struggles over resources and livelihoods in those contexts. Um, and then a particular suggestion of a focus on the, the proposed global green New Deal, dealing with climate justice and uh, bringing critical agrarian studies uh, to bear on that. But if you have any other suggestions, please do make contact and you're welcome to contact uh, Jenny Franco, who has kindly agreed to be um, the, the contact person. So if you have other suggestions of key issues that should be addressed in, in future webinars, uh, with a key speaker, a strong panel of discussants uh, from different backgrounds, and with a core paper that we can all read and think about, um, and use that as the launching pad for ongoing processes. So please uh, do uh, vote, and um, once you've voted, um, all there is uh, for us to say is uh, thank you very much to you for participating, uh, to the interpreters, in uh, French, Arabic, and Burmese. Uh, thank you very much. Apologies uh, for those of us who spoke too fast. We want to thank uh, TNI, the whole team, for your amazing support and for hosting uh, this webinar. So future webinars, you can find out more information by subscribing to TNI's newsletter. Uh, I think that uh, we're going to put up uh, the link so you can find it, not hard to find. Uh, the Transnational Institute's newsletter will always update you on these and other webinars. Um, and thank you to all those who dreamt up the series of conversations. Uh, you might also recognize the hand of uh, Jun Boras, editor of JPS and general initiator of many things. Thanks for the idea, Jun. A uh, last advert for, no, two last adverts. Firstly, um, an invitation to look at or listen to the Agrarian Politics podcast, which is anchored at my Institute Plus, but also collaborates with uh, Journal of Peasant Studies and CASAS. Uh, so you can find that on the Plus website, or you can follow most of the organizations here. Uh, the second advert is to uh, mention that next Friday, there is the next TNI webinar which will address the Arab uprisings a decade on with a focus on Egypt and uh, Tunisia. So with that said, um, a thank you very much to our participants for incredibly searching and, um, and wide ranging comments and questions to our wonderful presenters, uh, to TNI and, and the various hosts. And here we see, it seems like the, the front runner at present is authoritarian populism and the rural world as a top one with uh, Global Green New Deal and urban dimensions coming second and third. So thank you very much. Uh, and please do um, keep subscribed and uh, follow the organizations on Twitter and socials so that you can get updates on the next event, which will likely be, Tanya, in about um, the next three months or so, probably. Okay. Over to you, Tanya, any last word? No, well, um... It was amazing to see you. We had actually more than a 50% a participation from the people that register, which I know it's quite high. So we are excited. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us to the speakers. Um, and then that's it from my side.
Thank you. And on to more agrarian conversations in the future. Thank you all.